Let's get started. Welcome everyone to today's lunchtime HR hotline. I am Diane Mokriski, HR and Employment Counsel here at uh, CBIA. And today I have with me two attorneys from the law firm of Carmody, Torrance, Sandak, and Hennessy. Uh, Nick Zeno and Vincent Faricello are both partners at the firm. And they both represent employers in a wide variety of employment law issues that all you guys are facing out there today. And lately they've been advising clients um, on return to work issues, COVID issues, all the things that you guys are trying to deal with today and bringing people back to work. Um, and particularly the reopening of Connecticut that happens next week, May 19th and what impact that has on Connecticut employers. So on that note, the reopening um, next week, let's kind of jump in with that. My understanding is that everything, all the um, Connecticut mandates are going away next week with the exception of masks. So Nick, do you want to touch on that and explain sure. What's, what's the difference between May 1st and May 19th, and how does that impact employers and masks? You got it. Will do. Thanks, Diane, and thank you, uh, CBIA, and thank all of you for attending this, um, this webinar today. So, yes, um, the good news is that Connecticut continues to rank uh, among the top three states in the nation that have administered the most vaccines per capita, and about 57% of individuals have received at least one dose and of the approximate 1.5 million people who are vaccinated, um, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of those individuals have contracted COVID. So the vaccines are definitely working based on at least the early return, the data that we have received. And based on that, um, Governor Lamont announced about a month ago that um, he would end the COVID-19 restrictions for every sector and that that would occur in, in two steps beginning May 1, for um, outdoor activities and then May 19th for everything else. The only restriction that would continue to remain uh, would be the requirement to wear a mask in indoor public places. And so how that would work, all of you are familiar with, I hope, the various sector rules that the DECD had published about a year ago now um, for various businesses, offices, restaurants, fitness, fitness centers, gyms. Um, so those sector rules um, are going to be modified and then eventually just completely um, will no longer have the, the force of law. They will be considered best practices. So effective Saturday, May 1st, um, the curfew of restaurants, entertainment venues and theaters was pushed back one hour to um, 12 a.m. midnight. Um, bars that don't serve food could open for service outdoor only. And the eight person um, per table limit for restaurants was lifted for outdoor. It still remains in effect, at least until May 19th um, for indoor, indoor dining. And then effective May 19th, all remaining business restrictions will, will end, including stadium capacity and event venue limits. And then bars can operate indoors. Um, as I mentioned, indoor masks would continue. And I'll touch on that in a minute. And then the last point is the Department of Public Health is supposed to issue recommendations for indoor in large outdoor events. And that may be relevant for employers who are hosting events, or if you're having your employees attend events, you know, you should keep an eye out for the DPH guidance when, once it does come, come out. Um, but on the mask, uh, the continuing wearing of masks, just as a reminder, um, the governor had issued an executive order on this point exactly. And just as a reminder, all employees are required to wear a face mask under that order, you know, while in the workplace, except when they're um, on break time, eating um, or drinking. And if they're working in a segregated space like a cubicle with walls or a private office, then they can remove their mask while they're in that segregated space. However, when they move through the building and common areas, um, they are required to then wear the mask. And for employees who work in congregate settings, like in a, a open manufacturing floor, uh, masks would be required unless it's sparsely populated congregate area um, where there's at least 15 feet of um, distance between employees. In that case, they would not have to wear a mask. So, so yes, employees should continue to wear a mask uh, for the time being unless something further changes, um, which we hope it will, and conditions continue to improve in Connecticut. Okay. 
Um, so we just have to hang in there a little bit longer and hopefully, I mean, as the summer continues or maybe, I don't know, hopefully we don't have to wait till fall, but for now we're wearing masks indoors, right? For the most part. Correct, yes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about getting employees back to the office. Um, and I wanna talk about it in two contexts. One is kind of more related to COVID and one is not. So first of all, uh, let's, let's just start with the basics. Can employers require their employees to come back to the office in person? Yes, so under the sector rules, um, the DECD encourages em employers to allow employees to telecommute or work from home or, or outside the physical workplace. Uh, but once the, you know, the restrictions are removed on May 19th, yes, employers can require that their employees return to work back in the office. And that's really an individualized assessment for each employer. Like you have discretion to make that assessment as to whether you want to have your employees um, return back to working in the office. If it's been working well and you want employees to continue to, to work remotely, you have that discretion. If you feel that employees are more effective and more efficient when they're in the office, the employer has sort of has the right to have employees come back to the office. The only exception, of course, is the employee that may have a medical issue that prevents the employee from working back in the office, in which case the employer would have to engage in an interactive process and possibly explore allowing that employee to continue to work remotely for a longer period of time while they're, while they're disabled. Uh, but certainly right, so, an employer can bring, bring their employees back. So, so one question was, you know, what, let's say it's not even COVID related. We've just got employees who don't want to drive in, don't want the commute, don't want to have to put on a tie. Um, what can, an employer do and what can an employer not do? Is there, is there, I mean, can the, if an employee doesn't want to come in, the employer can just terminate them. Am I right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think before you, before an employer jumps there, but um, the employer should, should try to explore with that employee, the reason why the employee doesn't want to report to work. Um, and if the reason is just, you know, just convenience for the employee, they prefer to work at home or they, they don't want to put a tie on or, um, whatever the case may be, but it's not related to something that's protected like a disability, um, then the employer can say, well, look, I do want you back in the workplace. Maybe the employee will say, well, I'm nervous. I, I'm, I'm concerned. You know, I know that you have employees working for you who aren't vaccinated and I don't want to be in a workplace if there are individuals there who are not vaccinated. Um, the employers are not required to vaccinate all, not required to mandate that their employees be vaccinated. And so in that case, I think the employer would want to tell that employee all the things that they're doing, they've been doing and that they will continue doing at least for some period of time um, to ensure that the workplace is safe and that you, know, you can allay their fears that about coming back to work. That's the best the employer can do. But at the end of the day, unless it's a disability that's preventing that employee from returning to work um, or there's other reasons that are protected under law like the FFCRA, the employer has the right to have employees return back into the office. Okay, and so you you touched on the issue of vaccination. Some people will be vaccinated, some people won't. Are there any rules about having, you know, distinguishing amongst employees that way? Only having vaccinated employees come in, for example. Yeah. So OSHA had issued a guidance that's directly that directly addressed that question, and OSHA. Um, in their guidance. Now it's not a regulation, it's not a, it's not the, doesn't carry the force of law, but it is the federal agency that um, is, uh, is tasked with ensuring that workplaces are safe. And OSHA said basically that you should not distinguish um, in safety measures between those employees who have been vaccinated and those who have not been vaccinated. And OSHA specifically referenced the wearing of masks and said, you know, that uh, individuals who've been vaccinated because we're not certain yet whether they can continue to spread the virus, they should continue to wear a mask just like unvaccinated employees. So I would, except for isolation, which we can talk about in a little bit later, um, or quarantining, uh, vaccinated employees should be treated in the same manner as unvaccinated employees. Okay. Um, and so a question came in about hybrid arrangements. I'm not sure specifically what that question is, um, but 
if an employer is considering having some people work from home, some people come in, is there any other than what you just said about not distinguishing between vaccinated and unvaccinated, can you think of any pitfalls that they would, anything they would do wrong if they had a mixed bag and some people were working from home or some people had mixed schedules? Yeah, no, I think that that happened pre-COVID. Like there are some jobs that employers have determined um, are well suited for remote work. And there are some jobs that employers are determined are not well suited for remote work. And so that analysis can continue. Um, the only, you know, the only caveat is don't make that distinction based on like health status, for example, or some other protected category. But if an employer determines that, let's say certain, um, um, certain sales job duties related to sales can be done just as well outside the office at home as it could be in the office and the employer wants to continue to allow remote work, that's fine too. Employers should have a policy on um, telecommuting or remote work that defines those job positions that are, that are best suited for that. Okay. All right, so another question that came in uh, pertains to restroom capacity. And I guess that could apply to you know, office capacity as well. What's your understanding about that? A number of people you can have in different areas. Um, yeah, so I, again, I think with May 19th, all the restrictions are lifted, um, but that doesn't mean that employers shouldn't still look at those restrictions that have been in place for the past year and continue um, some or as many as the employer wants to continue for, for a bunch of reasons. One is the employee who's afraid to come back to work. But so I don't think an employer is required to have restroom capacity limits, but an employer may choose to do that as sort of best practices along with things like signage and you know having hand sanitizers you know one of the one of the great things that happened as a result of covid is the number of individuals who've gotten the flu has gone way down right and so that's because of all the precautions we've taken to guard against covid and so a lot of those are, are good practices anyway okay all right, so Vincent, let's move on to the FFCRA. Um, that's something that we were talking about a lot last year, 2020. Can you kind of just give us a sense of what's what's the status on that? What, what are we doing and is it required? It's a, it's a good question. The very brief answer is that um, FFCRA is currently in place, but in a modified form from what it was, um, and it's on a voluntary basis. Um, and so I'll get into that in a little bit more depth, but just the very quick um, background on it, just for you know, folks I'm sure you all recall, because we all lived through this, came out last year in March of 2020, was scheduled to expire at the end of the year, uh, mandated um, paid sick leave and paid emergency family leave for a number of different qualifying reasons. Um, but it also provided a dollar for dollar tax credit for employers who had to pay benefits out under the law. Um, and under the original law, there were um, six, six enumerated qualifying reasons, but only five of which were, were really in play. Um, those included um, an employee who couldn't work or telework because either one, they themselves were subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine. Uh, or isolation order, or two, um, they were advised by a doctor, healthcare provider to self-quarantine um, for a COVID-related reason, or three, they were experiencing a COVID symptom, they were experiencing COVID symptoms and, and were seeking medical diagnosis, uh, four, they were caring for an individual who was subject to a quarantine or uh, self-isolation order, or five, the one that was the most difficult um, was um, the need to care for a child whose school or daycare or childcare provider was unavailable. Um, under the second stimulus um, law that passed in December, FFCRA was extended beyond the original 1231 um, deadline. It was extended to March 31 of this year. And it was vir at that time, it was kept virtually the same. Um, except for the fact that the mandate was dropped. Um, in other words, it made it voluntary. Employers after December 31st could choose to continue offering that or not. So then I'll fast forward to March of this year. And when the American Rescue Plan um, was signed into law, 
it did a bunch of things with FICRA. Um, it extended it again, this time through September 30th of this year. Um, it maintained the voluntary nature of the FFCRA program. It also maintained the dollar for dollar payroll tax credit for those who do choose to participate, uh, continue participating. Um, it provided a reset of the 80 hours of paid sick leave available under FFCRA. And then the other thing, the big thing, what really changed things now is it provided some new and expanded qualifying reasons um, that apply to both the paid sick leave and the emergency family leave portion of FFCRA. Now, those additional new three reasons include, again, the ability, the, the inability to work or telework, but now um, includes when that is due to the employee recovering from an illness, any illness or condition related to receiving the COVID vaccine, which of course could uh, covers any of the side effects someone might get from getting the vaccine. Um, for time missed from work in order to obtain the vaccine, number two. Um, and then number three, um, any time missed during the period that the employee is seeking or awaiting results of a COVID diagnosis or a COVID test, or if the employer is requiring that the employee get a diagnosis or a test. Now, the other big thing that happened, so now, when you put the two together, the old law with, with these new changes, there's now all of those reasons, the old reasons and those three new reasons are all in play right now under FFCRA. The other interesting thing that happened is um, now all of those reasons qualify, um, qualify for both paid sick leave and emergency family leave. You might recall under the old rules, um, it was limited to 80 hours of paid sick leave for all of those reasons, the original reasons, but to get the 12 weeks of emergency family leave, that was limited to the child care um, portion of it. Now, um, uh, all of the reasons, both old and new reasons, uh, are eligible for uh, the full amount. All right, so one question that came in um, has to do with it's interesting because uh, Nick was talking about don't distinguish between vaccinated and unvaccinated, but we've had a lot of questions about, you know, how you can in, uh, not only incentivize people to get a vaccine, but how do you give the impression that you really want people to get vaccinated? And so one of the questions was with the FFCRA, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be our fault, in other words, the employer's fault, that you chose not to get vaccinated, and so now you keep getting sick, and so we're not going to give you, the unvaccinated people, paid leave when you have to be home because you got sick. But if a vaccinated employee, for some reason, needs to be home sick or take care of someone else, we will give the vaccinated people paid sick leave and ask for that tax credit. What do you think about that? So I think it, it, it poses an interesting overall question, right? I mean, because I know there are employers out there struggling with who, who, who want to encourage getting the vaccine, but don't necessarily want to mandate it. And so whether you, um, whether an employer decides to offer FFCRA, um, you know, either whether they offer it or they don't, in either way, it can be used um, as, a, as a method of providing an incentive to employees to get it. Um, because, you know, it, you know, I was talking to Nick about this yesterday and he put it in a really good way, depending on what you choose to do with it, you can, your, your decision to, per, to continue providing it can either be a carrot or a stick with regard to incentivizing FFCRA. Um, if an employer decides to voluntarily participate, that in a way is kind of like a carrot to encourage vaccination in the sense that, um, you know, folks will be able to, that there's a built-in ability to have paid time off at no cost to the employer too, um, for folks to go to miss work to get the vaccine or to cover any illness they have. So it can be sold to folks as, you know, go get it, you're not, you know, to the extent you have to miss work or you have some side effects that you have to miss work, you know, we're gonna offer this, you're gonna be covered. So there's an incentive there. 
you can, there's also the flip side of that where it can, in a sense, be used um, as a stick um, where it can kind of be sold that, listen, if we're not going to offer it, we are choosing not to offer it. Um, therefore, you should know that if you're not going to get vaccinated, um, that there's, you're not going to have FFCRA leave available to you. So if you're not going to get vaccinated and you get sick or whatever, you're going to be having to use, for example, your own paid time off benefits in order to, um, you know, to be covered for that time. So I think that's the overall question, but I think what you are getting at is goes, goes a step further. Can, can we then say we're going to offer FFCRA only to those who get vaccinated versus those who don't? Uh, under FFCRA, I mean, the, the, tech, the only thing that I'm aware of under the FFCRA rules um, that, that go into um, offering it to certain classes of employees or not um, have to do with um, you know, making sure that you're you're not uh, discriminating against non -high, highly qual non highly compensated employees. So I'm not sure that that's probably not implicated here. So then I think you just come down to the general considerations of um, you know, and, and I know Nick will get into this more with vaccines. We know probably by now that you have to make accommodations for those who can't get the vaccine for medical reasons. And so I would just wonder if having a rule like that, where you distinguish vaccinated versus not for offering an employment benefit, could start running afoul of some of those more general um, discrimination rules. So right. my thought is that I wouldn't recommend doing that, but, but, I, but, but I'm not opposed to using it on a broad scale. You're, by it, I mean your decision to participate or not, or continue offering it or not in a general sense, as like I said, as that carrot or stick for incentivizing the vaccine. All right, so if an employer wants to voluntarily give the FFCRA uh, paid leave, but they want to choose when to start and stop, like for example, they only wanna do it until school is done. Can the employer come up with that deadline on their own and say, okay, everybody, we're gonna give this leave until June 20th. Yeah, and my understanding of that um, and, and you or Nick, if, you, if you've seen something different, feel free to, to correct me. But my understanding of that was, yes, an employer can choose, can voluntarily choose to do it for a specified period of time only. Um, that, that, that's totally fine. Yep. Okay. Nick, do you have, do you have any thoughts on that? Nope, I defer to my trusted uh, partner, Vincent, on that point. <laughs> yeah, we, I've looked at it for, for others before, and, that, and that's my... It's been a while since I looked at that specific question, but uh, I'm pretty okay. sure that's what it came out on. All right, so one uh, question again on the FFCRA. This gets kind of complicated, but the question is, um, I mean, it's a legitimate question. It's just a complicated issue. Can you clarify, is the FFCRA eligible for 12 weeks if you're sick, or do you only get the 12 weeks for childcare? And is the 80 hours 100% paid for childcare or for sick? Which goes with which? So yes, the all reasons, including your own illness, are eligible for um, PSL or EFML, meaning the, the 80 hours or the 12 weeks. So I think that answers that one. Another interesting thing, is we are also pretty clear that as of April 1 with new FICRA, I'll call it new FICRA, under new FICRA, um, certainly the 80 hours of PSL resets, people get a whole new bank of 80. What we don't know yet, and I checked with some of my colleagues yesterday, it's still technically, and it seems to be still uh, a, uh, move, not move, it seems, still seems to be a, a question out there is whether, that 12 weeks reset also on April 1. That one is not as clear. The, the 80 hours certainly is, the, the 12 isn't. Um, so, so there's that. And then what was the, 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 there was another part of the question. Can you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I get to. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the, so the last part of that was, is the 80 hours 100% paid? Is that, can you use that for childcare or is that just for sickness? Oh, right. So there's still the, the two thirds 
um, the, the, the two thirds limit still applies to the childcare stuff. There's still that, 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 that distinction between, between that one versus um, uh, the, the two new categories. So the old distinctions remain on, in, in the new categories. I think those, all three of those apply to the employee own situation. So those are at the, the up to $511, 100% up to 511. Okay. All right, so um, Nick, are you, we've got some more vaccination questions. Sure. Um, I wanna clarify, um, can we, let's do the, can we mandate it? Can we ask about it? And what kind of proof can we ask for from our employees? Yes, yes, and yes. No, so, <laughs> but that kind of is the answer. Um, can you mandate it? So this question has come up a lot in the past few weeks. And, you know, in December of 2020, the EOC issued a guidance. And basically the EOC said, look, a, a vaccine, a vaccination is not considered a medical exam. And based on that, the general consensus is that employers can, can mandate the vaccine, can require their employees be vaccinated as a condition of employment with two big exceptions, right? The employees who cannot be vaccinated because of a medical condition and employees who um, will not be vaccinated because of sincerely held religious beliefs. So with those two exceptions, employers um, under the EOC's interpretation could mandate that their employees be vaccinated. But frankly, the, the full analysis is much more complicated than that. Like I think an employer um, before making that decision really needs to think about a couple of important things. Um, first, in my experience, and I think this is shared by others that I've spoken with, the vast majority of employers are not mandating at this time. And I think the surveys point that out as well with two major exceptions. I've seen it, uh, I've seen employers mandating with um, greater frequency in the educational world. So schools, colleges, universities, um, and I've seen it in healthcare settings, obviously. But apart from those two, and just sort of the general business world, manufacturing world, um, most employers are not are not mandating. Um, there's a few reasons for that, or I think a few things that employers are concerned about. One is, you know, the three vaccines that we currently have, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson, were all approved under an emergency use authorization. And it's not the full approval process that the FDA goes through in approving a vaccine. And without getting into too much of the technical legal regulatory issues, um, there is some question, there are some who have questioned whether or not the EOC's guidance applies in the case of vaccines that have only been approved through an EAU process. And there have been two lawsuits filed challenging the legality of employer mandates, employer vaccine mandates on that basis saying, you don't have the right to ma uh, mandate the vaccine if they've only been approved under an EAU basis. And so there's only two lawsuits, but, but there are two. Um, the EOC's guidance is one agency's guidance on one law, the ADA principally. Um, although the ADA is principally the, at issue, um, it is just one agency's guidance. It's not necessarily binding on states and it doesn't prevent employees from challenging any kind of mandate on other bases, other statutory, constitutional, common law claims. You know, the, the EOC's guidance does not provide employers immunity. Um, while, uh, you know, resistance to getting vaccines seems to be um, going down, which is a good thing, uh, there still is a considerable amount of vac vaccine hesitancy. And there was a recent CNN poll, recent, like within the past week or two, um, that showed that 26% of adults say they will not try to get a vaccine. They will, they will make the effort to become vaccinated. So, you know, an employer mandating that their employees be vaccinated really needs to weigh, one, the morale issue. Some employees will view that as being rather um, draconian or just the employer is sort of asserting its, itself too, too aggressively. And, and two, what are you going to do if employees don't, don't get vaccinated? What if just 10% or 15% of your workforce says, I don't wanna be vaccinated. Not, not necessarily due to medical or religious reasons, just don't, don't feel comfortable getting vaccinated. And so, you know, will, will an employer um, treat all employees who refuse to be vaccinated in the same way, including executives and, and sort of frontline workers? You know, that's a real question. And, um, you know, is there, is there the possibility for adverse publicity 
for employers who terminate employees who refuse to be vaccinated. So really there's a lot more at play, I think that employers need to consider. But the short answer is yes, an employer, uh, at least the general consensus is that the employer can require its employees to be vaccinated. Um, short of that, I know questions have come in too about can I ask employees whether they've been vaccinated or not? And the EOC addressed that specific point as well. And the EOC said, yes, yeah, simply asking an employee whether or not they've been vaccinated is not considered a, a, medical, a medical question or an inquiry that implicates the ADA. So simply asking, have you been vaccinated, yes or no, is, not, uh, is permissible. That is a fair and valid question for an employer to ask. It's also appropriate for an employer to ask for proof. If an employee says, yes, I've been vaccinated, it's okay for an employer to say, well, I'd like you to provide me proof of that, proof that or require that you provide uh, proof that you've been vaccinated. Where you have to be careful is if an employee says, I've not been vaccinated, and the employer then says, well, why? And then the employee says, because of a medical condition, and the employer begins probing about that medical condition. Now you have implicated the ADA and those sort of questions may not be appropriate, but simply surveying your workforce, if you wanna send out a survey, asking your employees, one, have you been vaccinated? Um, first dose, second dose. Um, two, do you plan to be vaccinated? Um, three, do you not plan to be vaccinated because of a medical reason or a religious reason? And just leave it at that. Or four, do you not plan to be vaccinated for, for any other reason, for personal reasons? Like that sort of survey is okay for employers to send out. Obviously, you, you know, you get those survey results, you wanna maintain them in a confidential manner. But, but yes, you can ask the question and you can require proof. Okay, and so then if the employee answers that survey and says, um, I'm not planning on getting vaccinated for a medical reason, and then the employer wants to evaluate whether it's a disability because people with disabilities don't, can't be forced to get a vaccine, then the employer- it, Yes. Yeah, in that case, yes, Diane, that's a good, that's a good question, yes. Um, in that case, the employer has a mandatory vaccination policy. The employee says, well, I'm not gonna get it due to a, due to a medical condition. Um, at that point, what the employer has an obligation to do is, is to consider whether or not that's a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. So you have to engage it, you know, in that situation in an interactive process um, with the employee, find out what the limitations are, find out and make an assessment as to whether or not it's a burden whether it's a hardship for the employer, an undue hardship for the employer to, to make that exception. Um, so in that situation, yes, the employer would have to ask some follow-up questions. The so then employer. I guess, would you say the, the only time it would be appropriate to ask those follow-up questions about the medical issues is if you're going to mandate it. Exactly, yes. Okay. Yes, if you're not gonna mandate, just being curious yeah. um, <laughs> is not, yeah, exactly. That That's not gonna work, exactly. Um, all right, so we've gotten a couple questions about uh, cleaning and sanitizing. So I think that might be a um, kind of like a reopening question. There were, there were, I guess, a lot of CDC guidelines mostly on how to clean in the workplace and how many times you should clean the bathroom and all that. What do you, what do you recommend if we're all reopening on the 19th and all the rules are out the window? What do you think that the cleaning and sanitizing rules are? Yeah, so um, again, we have federal laws that apply to workplaces. We have state laws that apply. Now, the CDC guidelines are guidelines. They're not, they don't carry the force of law. Um, but I don't think you throw all that stuff out the door. Like, I don't think May 19 comes and suddenly the employer stops, you know, going through, um, you know, going through all those protocols that have been in place for a year. Like, there are ones that I think and you know your workforce. For those of you who are in human resources on this call, you know which ones matter to your employees the most. You know which ones um, that they are most concerned about. And so I would, you know, if, if cleaning the bathrooms with greater frequency than you previously did pre-COVID is important to your employees and the CD, you, you know, you've been following the CDC guidelines, continue to follow the CDC guidelines, you know, um, they are guidelines for best practices for a reason. You still have a, a general duty under OSHA to provide a, a workplace free from hazards. So you don't wanna open the door in that situation to an employee saying, you stop cleaning the bathroom. You know, I didn't get the vaccine because of a medical condition, let's say, or they just didn't get the vaccine. They got COVID and they, they begin to, you know, point the finger at the employer. Even if there's not a strong basis to do that, um, if you know that that's a hot button in your workplace, to cleaning the restrooms with greater frequency, I would urge you to continue to do that and continue to follow the CDC guidelines on that point. 
So do you think that it would be okay, keeping all that in mind, would it be okay for employers to now um, rip up the arrows telling which, which way people should walk and take down the signs that say, wash your hands for 20 seconds and you know, all the, all the signs that we've all come up with and stickers we put on the walls. Do you think those can come down? Yeah, I think I think some of I think some of those things could, frankly, Diane. I think some of the measures that employers have taken um, could stop if it's if it's not something that um, is important in that particular workplace. You know, it's sort of something that was done, but maybe it's just not that it's just not that relevant um, at that point. Or you have a high level of employees that have been vaccinated, um, but some of, some of them I wouldn't like contact tracing, for example, I think you need to continue to do that because as long as you have unvaccinated employees in the workplace, um, if there is, or even vaccinated, if there's somebody who has COVID symptoms, they have to isolate for a period of time. And so you're going to continue to do, going to continue to do your contact tracing. Um, why would you remove all the hand sanitizers? I would keep those in place. Um, you know, so, you know, the masks are going to have to continue to be in place, but if the arrows, you know, didn't do that much, you know, uh, then you can take the arrows out, but maybe you leave office room or a conference room capacity limits in place for a little bit longer. So I think each employer needs to make that assessment on their own. Okay. So you um, started to mention uh, a little bit about quarantine. So I don't know uh, which one of you wants to talk about quarantining, um, but what are the, are the rules still the same if someone gets if someone is positive um and if someone else is exposed to the person who's positive what are the quarantining rules so we'll start with just your yes yeah, so um the quarantine rules are slightly different for those who've been vaccinated so um let me just start with slightly different so those who are not vaccinated let's say According to the CDC, they still continue to recommend that um, the most protective approach for the workplace is for exposed employees to quarantine for 14 days, okay, and self-monitor for symptoms. But the CDC um, allows for a shorter period of time under two conditions. And so those who've been exposed or those who've been in close contact um, with someone who has been infected, and that's somebody who tested positive or somebody who um, yeah, tested positive and has symptoms and those who have not tested positive, um, or I'm sorry, those who are asymptomatic but have tested positive. So if you've been in close contact 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period, then you have to quarantine for 14 days according to the CDC. You can shorten it to 10 days if the person has continuing, continued to daily monitor themselves and they have no symptoms. And you can shorten it to seven days if they've monitored themselves and they tested negative. So the standard, the gold standard is 14 days. It can be 10 days with no test and daily monitoring. It can be seven days um, with a negative test, okay? For those who've been vaccinated and are asymptomatic, so you've been vaccinated, you've been closely, you've been in close contact with somebody who's been infected, um, there is not, but you're asymptomatic, there is not a requirement to quarantine. So, you know, that going back to Vincent's point about the FFCRE being a carrot and a stick, again, if somebody's in close contact and they haven't been vaccinated, it's going to either be 14 days, 10 days, or seven days, whichever approach the employer takes. Um, but if they've been vaccinated and they're asymptomatic, then there's no requirement to quarantine at all. If they've been vaccinated and they're symptomatic, then they have to follow the 14, 10, or seven day rules. Okay. That's a, that's a lot to keep track of. So, <laughs> so hopefully if everything goes as planned, the numbers will just keep going down in Connecticut and we won't have to keep track of that for too much longer. Let's hope um, not, yes. All right, I, I'm gonna try to only ask you one more mask question. Okay. Um, if, if you know for a fact, let's say you're a small employer, you have, I don't know, five or 10 employees, you know for a fact everybody there is vaccinated. Do you think they everyone still has to wear a mask? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and that really gets into the finer point of whether or not the executive order is still is still law. I mean, if you, you know, the the CDC um, 
And I believe, you know, Governor Lamont has made statements that if you're in indoors and you're with individuals that are all vaccinated, you know, you're with a group that you know all to be vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. So I think there's a basis to take that position. There's a, there's a reasonable basis to say, look, we're a small office, there's five of us, we've all been vaccinated. Um, there's no need to wear a mask in that situation. And I think the risk of, of a COVID issue there is very, very low. Uh, but short of that, um, I think you should continue to have your employees wear the mask. And if you're not sure, continue to have your employees wear the mask. I guarantee you when the mask mandate is definitely gone, period, for everyone, we will all know about it. Like that will be big news and, and welcome be news. Party. Exactly. So th there will be no ambiguity on that point. Yeah. All right. Um, on the issue of um, the exception, if you were going to mandate uh, the vaccine and there were two exceptions, people who had medical issues or people who had a religious belief that prevented them from getting a vaccine, what can an, what can an employer ask for as proof of a sincerely held religious belief. Right, so the EEOC guidance, uh, when it talks about, um, when it talks about making that assessment, the EEOC said in normal circumstances, just assume that it's a sincerely held religious belief. Like that's what the EEOC guidance says. Um, and mm -hmm. if there is, if you have as an employer, some objective evidence, some objective basis for questioning whether or not it's a, it's a sincerely held religious belief, then you can ask the employee questions about that. Um, and you should not, the EOC says, you should not demand that the employee provide a letter from the clergy or from, from some, um, you know, from a particularly, from, from, from a priest or a clergy, uh, but anyone who would support that employee's religious belief. And so it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a wishy-washy standard, to be honest with you. Um, but the EOC really doesn't want employers getting into an argument with their employees over that. So uh, you know you can ask questions about it, and, and there are times when you can deny it. You say I don't think there is, based on the objective evidence that you have, to honor that sincerely held, you know, to, to honor that request that it's due to a sincerely held religious belief. But I'd be very careful about asserting that um, asserting that position, and generally. Um, you know, would rely on the employee saying it in good faith. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Connecticut's travel restrictions. Um, I know that sometimes, um, well, we've had a question come up frequently when, what should an employer do when an employee goes on a trip and then comes home and then they have to quarantine? Um, Vincent, can you touch on that? I mean, are the travel restrictions still a thing? Yeah, so the, the quick answer on that is no. Um, Connecticut's travel advisory, as it was in effect for a good bit of last year and early this year, um, it went away on March 19th. Um, and so it's not in place anymore. But the state does still recommend that travelers um, um, follow any travel related guidance from the CDC. So I guess a good place. So no Connecticut law or, or order in place now, um, but just uh, the, the guidance is to you know, follow what the CDC guidance is. So just I'll talk a little bit about what CDC is saying about it. Um, I'll try to do this in broad brush strokes. Um, with regard to domestic travel, um, they kind of break up the guidance between um, guidance for those who are fully vaccinated and of course fully vaccinated meaning Two weeks have elapsed since the, you know, either the second dose if you're on, if you've got Pfizer or Moderna, or two weeks after your one dose of Johnson and Johnson. Um, but the, their guidance for fully vaccinated folks is premised on the idea that since those folks are less likely, unlikely to contract and spread COVID, um, you know, they can travel freely within the United States. They, of course, while they're traveling, should still wear a mask. Um, they should still practice social distancing while they're traveling. They should they still should continue washing their hands and, and practicing good hygiene and sanitation sanitizing. Um, so that's for the fully vaccinated folks. What CDC recommends for non-vaccinated persons um, is that when they return from travel, um, that they get tested between three and five days after their travel and that they self-quarantine at home. 
for full seven days after their travel. Um, and, and in fact, CDC goes a little further and says um, that seven day quarantine should last for the full seven days, even if that test that you took on day three or four or five comes back negative before the end of the seven day period. Um, and if someone is not going to get tested and therefore won't get a negative test, CDC recommends that those folks self-quarantine for a full 10 days after travel. So again, we're talking about domestic travel at this point. And so, you know, I, I suppose in a way that it might appear that that conflicts with the, the state no longer requiring um, those quarantine and testing rules for travel. But again, I, I know Nick had mentioned this before. I, I would just, you know, remind folks that this is the, the CDC stuff. This is guidance, doesn't have the full force of law, their recommendations. So um, folks aren't you know, required here in Connecticut to follow that. Employers certainly aren't, you know, required to ensure that their employees are abiding by it. But it does, you know, beg that question, what role do employers have since, since there is no legal mandate? Um, you know, when I think of that, the things that come to my mind is I, I still think um, employers should try to limit business travel. Um, to the extent possible, um, you know, we've gone a while with with restricting it, and so to the extent that an employer can get away with putting it off longer, I think that's a good idea. In terms of you know employees' personal travel, you know, I think this is uh, you know it's 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 an employer's decision to make. I think the fact that the CDC guidance is out there um, provides a good basis for an employer to say that they if should they choose to um, you know, not allow, for example, someone who went on vacation to come back to the workplace for seven or 10 days. The CDC guidance certainly gives a good justification for doing that, um, but again, um, certainly not uh, required at all. With regard to international travel, um, you know, I, I do know that um, to the extent, what, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, to, to travel back to the US by air, there are um, still testing rules, and that applies to both vaccinated um, and non-vaccinated folks. All right. So, if um, if I'm going to ask you an FFCRA question, so if um, an employee travels and then comes back home and is not subject to a quarantine rule, let's say this person is vaccinated but the employer doesn't want the person to come in because they've been traveling. Does that mean that because there was no required quarantine that, that the employer would not be able to give FFCRA paid leave and get a tax credit for that because there was no quarantine? I, I don't think that that qualifying reason would apply because there is no federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order, but Remember under the new reasons, one, one of the new qualifying reasons is um, time missed because the employer has requested a test or diagnosis. So, you know, that, that, that's gonna take several days, may not cover the entire seven or 10 day, well, seven day period, because if we're, if we're talking about the, the having to get a test um, or a diagnosis, normally that's gonna involve a test. But I, I do think there's some opportunity for FFCRA coverage if the employer is, um, you know, you know, the employer is who's kind of forcing the issue. Okay, so uh, a question came in on that very issue, um, but the question was, since the employer is in this particular case, it has to do with someone coming back um, after a trip to Africa. So if the employer is requiring testing and requiring the employee to stay home based on these guidelines, does the employer have to pay him for the time that he's home or is that voluntary? So I'm gonna, you know, take it out of the, you know, from, from the context of FICRA, again, to the extent that that new qualifying reason I, I just mentioned applies and the employer is a participating employer, um, and the employee has still has time, it may be covered there. Um, with taking that out of the equation, um, 
no, I think the, the, the general answer, and that's kind of goes back to the, we were dealing with similar issues or, you know, last year. And um, no, there, there, there wouldn't be a general obligation to pay someone um, while they're, you know, while, while we're telling them to stay home. If they're not doing work, they're generally not going to be required to. to right. And, and so all of this FFCRA time is still voluntary anyway, right? So even if even if the the situation falls squarely within one of the reasons to give the paid time, it's still all voluntary, am I right? Exactly, exactly. If the employer chose has chosen we are not continuing to do that, then the FFCRA certainly would not apply. Okay. So now, Nick, back to you. There was um, we we're talking about coming back to work, and one of the questions was, "Do you think there will be new sector rules on May 19th?" You know I, how they were individual sector rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't heard that there would be. Um, you know, I think I think what I would do is is continue to to look at your individual sector, the the rule. What they'll do is they'll update the rules. Like if anything, they're just going to continue to uh, DECD will continue to update the sector rules that are currently in place. Um, but I'm not anticipating a whole new set of rules coming in. So there may just be some changes. And they've added language to the sector rules, you know, suggesting that they're best practices. And so, you know, they may be just that. They may continue to remain there, but not not be mandated. Just be considered best practices. But um, I don't expect a whole different set of rules coming out. Okay, um, do you know if, um, what's your feeling on social distancing at work? Is that required or recommended or what? Yeah, so I don't think, again, under the May 19th, the governor was pretty clear that all restrictions would be lifted um, with the exception of indoor masks, the use of indoor masks. And so I don't think it's required. Um, but that is one of those where the employer really needs to think about whether it wants to continue to require social distancing for a little bit longer. So for example, if you have arranged workstations so that there is six feet of space between your employees, um, you might decide, you know what, I wanna continue that for an additional 30 days, just out of an abundance of caution. I know, I know I'm not legally required to do that, but I think it's a good practice. It makes most of, you know, some of my employees feel a little bit better about coming to work. Um, and so we still are, it's still a pandemic. It's still declared an international pandemic. And so you may decide you want to carry that longer. You should do that. Same thing with conference rooms. If you want to leave a, you know, a seat in the middle when you're sitting around a conference table, you should continue to do that. So some of that just requires good common sense and knowing your employees, knowing your workforce, um, knowing what matters most to them. Um, I think that that is, is very much an individualized um, determination. Okay, so would you say that that same thing, there was a question about uh, taking temperatures. You think the same thing goes for that? I mean, taking, um, so I think taking temperatures continues to be okay as long as we're in a pandemic. Again, that's your, your you know, the EOC came out and said it's okay given that we're in a pandemic. And so, so we, because we're still in a pandemic, I think that is, um, um, okay for an employer to continue that practice, you know, as we hopefully the numbers decline and the number of COVID cases decline and the number of vaccinations increase. And, um, you know, that may not be an acceptable practice anymore, but I haven't heard anything from the EOC saying that they've rescinded that guidance. So for now, I think it's okay. Okay. All right. Um, a question about the vaccine. If, um, if the employer mandates the vaccine, and then the employee gets a side effect from it. Um, or uh, even a, I haven't heard of very many serious side effects. Let's say a side effect that lasts several days. What's the liability there? Is that workers comp or like, what is that? Yeah, so I think in, in, the, um, in the list of considerations, that's one of the ones that I should have mentioned. Uh, that, that is one that I think employers are nervous about. You know, what if I mandate it and there's an employee who, because I mandated it, because they have to pay their mortgage, they have to pay their bills, um, they otherwise wouldn't have gotten the vaccine. But because I'm mandate, mandating it as a condition of employment, they go out and they get the vaccine. And let's assume they have a severe, you know, a severe um, reaction to getting it. 
you know, is the employer liable for that? And I think that's a real concern for employers. It's probably would probably be considered a workers' comp claim for the employer um, since it's a an injury or, or an illness arising out of the workplace. Um, but I think that's one of those considerations that makes employers nervous. Even if it is a workers' compensation claim, you know, that that carries with it that fact, if that were to occur, um, is not a good thing for an employer and something that, you know, their, um, their employees would be happy about. So that is definitely a consideration for employers. The other thing is um, it would be, on a pop, it, it, to the extent the employer has elected to continue providing FFCRA, that time missed could be, you know, does fall under one of the new qualifying reasons. Okay. Right. Okay. And the, the workers' compensation presumption, in other words, the presumption that if you get sick with COVID while you're, you know, you're not laid off, you're, you have a job, if you get COVID, there used to be, am I right, a presumption that you got it at work. Is that presumption uh, gone now? Yes. Yeah. Go, oh, ahead, go ahead, Vincent. No, I think the presumption was for a for a limited period of time and for a certain industry, the healthcare, I think, industry. I don't think that applied generally. No, uh, it, 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 correct, did. It, it, just, was it, it was just okay. for a, a very limited period of time. It was under an executive order. It's expired. There's been some, you know, <laughs> perhaps even a bill proposed to, to, to add it. Um, um, but, but I think the executive order you're talking about was the one that um, was from last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have either of you uh, seen any stories on this or seen any evidence that an employer sh uh, should be worried about or could be found liable, not workers' comp, but some other way, liable to employees because of the, be because of the way they're handling COVID at work? So for example, I don't know, like someone they're not being careful enough at work and then someone gets it and they die or anything like that. Have you heard anything about employers liability because of the way they're handling COVID? Yes, yeah, so I know the workers' compensation exclusivity bar, which, which excludes any claim for injuries or illnesses arising out of the workplace is a pretty, um, um, it's a pretty high bar, but I do believe there are instances where you can go, you can get around the exclusivity bar, but I, I think it's like for recklessness. I'm not 100% certain on that, but it's got to be something pretty egregious to get around the workers' compensation bar. Um, I'd have to go back and look at that language specifically. But, but in general, if an employer is being, you know, fairly responsible, following the rules, and, and there's a, you know, maybe didn't do something quite right and somebody did contract COVID, um, their claim is pretty much going to be barred by the workers' comp act. In other words, that would be their remedies to file a workers' comp claim. Okay. Um, a question about the vaccine survey that you mentioned earlier. Um, do you think that a survey is necessary or can you just kind of inquire of individual employees as things come up? Like if you, have a positive case, can you then go around and ask the people who might be impacted whether they've been vaccinated or should you just ask everybody all at once? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a requirement as to how you do it, but I think an employer has the right to ask an employee whether or not they've been vaccinated. Um, I would probably suggest that an employer do it not in response to a specific incident, but just do it generically. And why might an employer want to know that information? One, it might help formulate whether or not the employer wants to mandate. It might help formulate um, a certain activities that the employer wants wants to have in the workplace. So, you know, are you going to have a holiday party at the end of the year? You know, are you going to have um, a webinar, a live seminar for for um, folks? Are you going to do you want to reassure your customers or your clients that? You know, a high percentage of your employees have been vaccinated. So I think the information could be helpful for an employer. You know, do you want to continue to have the arrows? You know, how many, if you've got 90% of your folks have been vaccinated, maybe you don't need the arrows on the floor anymore. Um, so I think the information can be helpful, helpful for an employer. I would probably just do it um, generically, not necessarily in response to an incident, 
on an ad hoc basis. But I don't think that's 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 not a legal thing. That's just a um, a recommend a suggestion I would have. Have you do you have any recommendations about um, the company's summer picnics and outings and things like that? Things having to do with social distancing and what, what do you what do you think the general? Yeah, rule so. So that's where I said at the beginning, um, and I'm, I'm kind of looked the other day, I think it was yesterday, I looked to see if DPH, so when the governor announced the reopening and DEC, DECD put out an updated guidance, um, they indicated in that updated guidance that DPH would be issuing um, some guidance on, on uh, indoor and large outdoor events. And so I think it's okay to have large outdoor events, but follow the DPH guidance that comes out. So keep an eye out for that when it does come out. Um, hopefully it comes out soon. Um, but I think it's okay to begin begin doing some of that, um, some of those outdoor activities in a responsible manner, you know, consistent with uh, DPH guidance. Okay. Well, that is our lunch hour. Thank you very much, Nick and Vincent. That was very helpful. Um, I think we actually answered most of the questions too. We got to a lot of them. So um, everyone out there, you can contact Nick and Vincent directly at Carmody, Torin, Sandak, and Hennessy. Um, and you can always contact me at the hotline. I have a brand new sign behind me so you can see the phone number. Um, and so I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and we will see you next time. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys.